All right. Well, hello. Welcome to the fifth episode of Cross Isle Talk. This is a podcast about how BIPOC mental health practitioners and scholars can work together to better support BIPOC communities and each other. My name is Dr. Donna Dimanarig, and today I am excited to have with us Dr. Grace Chen. Hello, Dr. Chen. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. So Dr. Chen is a licensed psychologist, a coach and consultant based in the San Francisco Bay Area. She received her PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Dr. Chen supports psychology graduate students in their professional development through her psych grad corner workshops, advising, and online resources. She works with a variety of individuals, including Asian, Asian Americans, other people of color, immigrants, women, and LGBTQ folks. She's a member of the Psychology of Radical Healing Collective with fellow psychologists of color and provides consultation and group facilitation regarding radical healing from racial trauma. Dr. Chen values sharing knowledge about wellness and resisting oppression through blogs, podcasts, and community presentations. In her personal life, she co-leads an anti-racist parent group in her local community. She also enjoys hiking and spending time with her family. So um, welcome. Thank you for having me. So just real quick, I know this wasn't one of the uh, (laughs) pre questions, but I'm just really excited that you like hiking too. Nice. (laughs) I know when I wrote that, I was like, not long hikes, (laughs) you know, (laughs) short hikes. (laughs) So not the, you know, going up the mountain three day hike. No, no, it's actually, we're very fortunate where we live. We can get to a good hike within five minutes of my house driving. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So I go pretty often, Yeah, nice. but those are short hikes. <laughs> gotcha. No, I'm with you. <laughs> so um, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, I mean, I, I read your bio in terms of what you do for your work, but just a little bit more about your work uh, more specifically. Yeah, I do a lot of different things. Um, You know, one of the main things uh, I do is work as a therapist and provide individual psychotherapy. Uh, But I do include a lot of other activities in my work week, if you will. Um, One of the other things I do is I work with the Psychology of Radical Healing Collective. And most of those folks are um, actually all of them are academics. Mm -hmm. And so I'm the one clinician in the group, but we do a lot of a mix of different activities. So uh, there are manuscripts. So I take a little bit more of a backseat on that, but I am involved in some of the scholarship. And then we also have a psychology today blog because we're trying to share information more with the general public. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we do presentations. So we do a lot of different things together um, and that keeps me busy as well. Um, And I do coaching around career issues for folks Mm -hmm. Uh, in addition to therapy. And then uh, uh, as you mentioned in my bio, I do, um, I would have a website for graduate students in psychology and uh, we're gearing up for uh, the season where uh, psychology students are applying for internships. And so mm-hmm. I'll be hosting different workshops and things like that in the summer for them. Nice. So basically it's um, work where people outside of academia, outside of you know, working in the mental health field um, can easily access Mm -hmm. and understand. Right. Yeah. So that's, it's a mix of things. And Mm -hmm. as I thought about like, oh, what do I do? I'm like, oh, there's so many different things. I mean, my paid work is Mm -hmm. the therapy and the coaching um, and some consulting, Uh, but I really do enjoy the community work. I'm also, I do some volunteer presentations for community um, the, an upcoming one I have, I'm really excited about I'll be doing a presentation for high schoolers. Oh, um, nice. They created this organization about for Asian Americans, and I'll be doing a, a radical self-care workshop for activists for them this week. So it's interesting that you mentioned radical self-care. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What is that? Um, 
You know, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually. And so it's it's this concept that has evolved over time for me. Um, a lot of folks are may be familiar with Audre Lorde's quote about um, self-care is not self-indulgence. It's an act of uh, preservation. I'm sure I messed that up a little bit. But, um, <laughs> but this idea is that we are not whole people if we're not taking care of ourselves mm-hmm. fully. And the way I've been really reflecting on this idea of self-care. It's not the commercial aspect that we think about in terms of mm-hmm. um, how the U.S. talks about self-care and- Like you know, manicure, for, pedicure, like- Manicure, shopping. pedicure, yeah. shopping, right, retail right. there, you know, you know, uh, yoga, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it's because th- that's very individualistic and also very consumerist right, uh, focused, right? Mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so- um, the way I think about it is this idea of slowing down and really kind of being in tune with ourselves in terms of like what's motivating us, what's feeding us, what's Mm -hmm. refreshing us. And so in order for us, not just to survive in the world, but to thrive in the world, what do we need to do? Mm -hmm. And and a lot of these ideas come from, um, I'm definitely feeling very inspired by the NAP ministry, which is um, this person, it's their project, uh, but they're on Instagram and Twitter, but they talk about rest as resistance. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know? and, and so the way I've kind of folded that into some of the radical healing work that we've been doing is that there's a psychology of really understanding how to be in community with other people. So radical self-care is also this idea that it doesn't have to be something you're doing by yourself. In fact, Um, one of the things that we need to be doing is paying attention to connections mm -hmm. and being in community with one another, because that's what can feed us, but that also is what supports us and how we feel like, okay, that, you know, that we are kind of on the right path if we're feeling into attuned to ourselves and with other people. Okay. So with that whole concept of radical self-care, how do you think we can apply that to what's going on in our world now with the pandemic, you know, with the rampant uh, murder and police brutality of, you know, BIPOC folks, and of course the rise in anti-Asian violence? How can we utilize this whole notion of radical self-care, um, not just as therapists, but you know, as members of communities? Yeah, I, I think what's hard is that it's this balance. Um, mm-hmm. And this is part of the radical healing, that there's a dialectic that we're acknowledging that we're experiencing oppression um, and violence and harm and trauma, but we're also trying to hold on to hope um, and liberation and this idea that we can have wellness. So mm-hmm. it's, it's both. So with self-care, it's also this idea of holding both ideas of really acknowledging the pain that we're experiencing. And, and I know you might hear this a lot where people are like, I want to be doing something. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, maybe part of the healing process is not doing something, but just kind of being in community mm-hmm. with other folks or, sometimes we do need time to ourselves because, you know, there are times we do need to process things. So I think that's, what's hard is like people say, Oh, you know, we can have all these healing spaces, but what are we doing? So, well, we need both. We need both. And I think a lot of times in our culture, we rush to get past that healing process and go to action. And, and part of it is because we feel like not enough being done. And that's probably Mm -hmm. true, but we also want to think about what's sustainable for ourselves personally, but also as a community that we need to have both Mm -hmm. at the same time of like that we have to have healing, which means being in community, being supportive of one another, um, understanding the bigger picture, and then, but, and then working towards creating, you know, an action plan of what you want to be doing to, to enact change on a more systemic level. Yeah, yeah, no, I I completely agree with you. Um, And do you see any difference in terms of the the clients that you know that you've seen um especially during the pandemic and you know in this era of uh, the rise in anti-asian violence you know i haven't had 
a lot of turnover in my clients. You know, it, it, some folks who were doing pretty well before mm-hmm. the pandemic stuff happened, then they were like, oh, I'm not going anywhere once like there was lockdown because there's just a lot to, to manage at one time. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but what I would say is that I think folks are really understanding, just trying to figure out how to, I, I don't even want to say balance, but they're trying to figure out how to feel okay within mm-hmm. themselves. Um, and a lot of it is, I, I think people are identifying anxiety as something that's coming up for them. But a lot of it is because there's a lot of questioning of, do I know myself and what works for me, right? Because we have all these external messages of what we need to be doing. Right. We need to be productive at work, or we mm-hmm. need to be really, really, really good at what we do. Not just good, but exceptional at what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, if they're a parent, then I need to be an amazing parent. So there's a lot of pressure that folks have. They identify it as being internal, but it it's definitely internalized Mm -hmm. messaging, you know, from our, our culture of things. So I think that's a lot to manage. And every now and then I'll actually have to slow down and tell people like, and you're dealing with this within a pandemic. (laughs) Right. And then they're like, Oh, right. Like it's, (laughs) it it has sort of become the normal, but it's like, we don't talk about it. Right. As a, as a culture, we haven't really acknowledged the grieving and the loss, the various kinds of losses we've experienced this past year and a half. And and so I think it's unspoken, but the impact is still there on people in addition to all the personal things that are going on in their lives. And so often the different things we talk about, the pandemic piece or COVID precautions Mm -hmm adds multiple layers to that in terms of social interactions. It's no longer just about the social interactions. It's about who wears masks, who doesn't, who's, you know, it's right. Right. It gets a lot more complicated. So there's so many more layers to consider. And so then I had to remind folks like, this is not the usual kind of anxiety or stress that Mm -hmm. people have dealt with in the past. Yeah. And um, has it, affected your ability to um, work or even how you approach work? You know, it's in a strange way, it has been helpful because Mm -hmm. we're all experiencing the same thing in terms of the pandemic. So that has been helpful because it's Mm -hmm. very much, I completely understand what they're talking about, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I think the moments that have been maybe a little bit more challenging is working with some white male clients who Mm -hmm. have, you know, their experience of what's happening with, um, you know, the racial reckoning that's been happening since last summer and just kind of where I'm positioned as an Asian American woman. I think that can, that has been a little bit challenging Mm -hmm. um, just because we have different experiences. So there are moments where I'm like, I'm having a harder time empathizing with their hard time being Mm -hmm. white men. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how do you deal with that? I mean, you know, um, having to deal with clients who are, who have a different experience than you do, or for in, you know, in some of our cases or in academia, um, how we deal with white colleagues or white students who don't have that experience mm-hmm. that we have, we, we had. I mean, I think it goes back to the basic aspect of empathy and just really trying to understand their perspective. Um, and, and sometimes we can have a, a deep conversation about like, especially depending on their awareness, like they'll, they'll, Mm -hmm. you know, they could say something, but they also have this awareness of like, it's within the context of like, I know I don't have it as bad and then it's okay. Like, well, I appreciate you acknowledging that and it's still hard for you. Right. So I just kind of lean into that empathy of it being a hard thing, but also honoring that they are trying to be reflective about the context and what that means and how they're just trying to hold maybe mixed feelings yeah. for themselves. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely a good uh, way of looking at it and not just in therapy, mm-hmm. but in general, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, as soon as I had finished talking, I was like, I might be a little bit different if it were my colleagues <laughs> than, than my clients. <laughs> or or said, people I mean, that different... you know. 
Right. I mean, it's a different relationship and that's and, true. And actually, you know, it all comes down to relationships, right. In terms right. of how we can deal with tough topics and how invested you are in those relationships. So how would you deal with it if it was a colleague? <laughs> and I think, you know what I'm talking about, Grace. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm thinking <laughs> this is why I work for myself by myself. Um, <laughs> You know, that's really hard. I I really think about, um, you know, when I have been, when I have worked in an institution Mm -hmm. and I think about uh, my position in terms of power or not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my last job, I was in this kind of hybrid faculty staff type position, but I wasn't, um, I wasn't on tenure track and I wasn't evaluated by a tenure track tenured Mm -hmm. folks. Mm -hmm. And so I think once I figured that out, I was like, oh, I can probably speak up more in meetings than the junior faculty, Mm -hmm. um, who a lot of them were women and women of color. Mm -hmm. So I think I I learned that I had a little bit more power in those situations. And so Mm -hmm. I would speak up a little bit more. And it's not necessarily uh, dealing with explicit racism or sexism. Um, or both, but it's usually the dynamic of something. So if there's like an older white male colleague who interrupts Mm -hmm. all the time, Mm -hmm. like he does it so often that I knew I could prepare for it Mm -hmm. when he interrupted me when I spoke. And so when he interrupted, I just cut him off right away and I just called him on it. And, and I just said, you know, you've interrupted, you know, it's just very matter of fact, you've interrupted every single person who starts talking and I would like to finish first. And he just stopped you know, nice. um, and I know other people wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. I am probably a little bit more direct than other folks might be. Um, but I wasn't mean about it either. You know, just right. kind of matter of fact, just observed what he had been doing, told him I didn't want him to do that to me and he could wait. So sometimes it's more about that, right? It's like a certain yeah. dynamic where yeah. he's not consciously thinking like, oh, you know, she's an, a younger Asian American woman. I'm going to interrupt her. Right. <laughs> but, he, you know, there's a certain way that he was taking up space. It's subconscious. It's, you know, yeah. the way that we're all socialized. I mean, as women, especially as Asian American women, we are socialized to kind of take a step back, to listen, to be, you know, more humble, not to be so aggressive, whatever aggressive mm-hmm. means. Mm-hmm. Um Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and interrupting, like, right. Uh, that's something like you just don't interrupt. And actually, as a therapist, that's been really hard too. It's like there are right. times we need to interrupt our clients. And yes. that has been one of the more challenging things for me to learn over my career of like, sometimes you just got to interrupt. And, mm-hmm. and I, so I, I think even the clinical training has helped me get better at interrupting folks. Nice. Nice. Yeah, because like that, it's almost like it's going against, you know, what we've known and what we've been taught early on. And that's difficult to do. It really is. I mean, it's cultural in terms of being Asian. Right. It's cultural in terms of women and U.S. culture, too. Right. Yeah. We're nice. We pay attention to relationships. We don't interrupt. If we do say things, as you mentioned before, we are perceived as aggressive. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, at a certain point, it's like, that's more on you. That's more about you than it is about me. Exactly. Exactly. Which kind of is, it's a great segue to, I don't know if you, you saw the newest episode of last night with, um, what's his name? Uh, Oliver. No, I just saw that there was a, yes. About it though. And okay. I, I know the, um, uh, the AAP EC board were consulted a little bit. Uh, about that so I'm very like yeah I'm very happy with that segment but yeah he talked about the model minority myth right Uh, uh and um it's it's still astounding to me that not many people really know a lot about the the model minority myth um yeah (laughs) I know I know I know Uh, I know yeah okay (laughs) Okay. For us, it's, it's like a repetitive, okay, this yes, is getting old type right, of deal. But sure. you'd be surprised the majority of people in this country don't mm-hmm. know or even know that it exists, this whole notion mm-hmm. of model minority. Mm-hmm. 
And when you do talk about, you know, when you tell them what it is, they'll tell you, well, it's a good type of, uh, you know, stereotype. So what's mm-hmm, the big deal? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How do you respond to people like that? Yeah. Well, I guess my first reaction is it's so interesting. I think maybe 20 years ago, we would talk about model minority myth a lot, um, mm-hmm. like in college or, you know, student organizations, just in terms of Asian American activism. The, maybe the term has faded, but mm-hmm. those stereotypes have remained, right? mm-hmm. which that's a little bit scarier to me, right? That people yeah. aren't even recognizing them as part of this model minority myth. I think a lot of, like you said, a lot of Asian Americans are aware of it, but mm-hmm. um, non-Asian Americans, like they, it's not on their radar. So I right. think that already is a little bit dangerous. Um, yeah, this whole idea of good stereotype, it, it, it harms everybody. <laughs> um, yeah. I think the biggest piece is that zooming out of seeing like whenever we have good stereotypes, I think part of it is because we're trying to compare it to something else that's a bad stereotype. Right. And, you know, put putting Asian Americans in this model minority kind of uh, idea is really this idea of pitting us against black folks and Mm -hmm. Latinos and Latinx folks um, and indigenous folks. And this, this all came out from the 1960s, mm-hmm. as you probably know, yeah. um, of saying like, look, it's not about, oh, minorities can't be successful. Look at the Asians, they're successful right. um, economically uh, in this country, but they're not giving us the context of like the centuries of slavery and oppression towards African-Americans. Mm-hmm. Then the immigration policies that excluded Asians Mm -hmm. from the U.S. for many, many decades. Right. And then when they did open up the doors, it was to folks who were educated and or wealthy. Right. right? So it's like there's a certain filter coming in. So it's like if you don't provide the context, then it's easy to make it seem like it's just an inherent quality of these. Right. And then they're also lumping the term Asian American into this homogenized group. Oh, my goodness. Right. (laughs) Yes. And not really acknowledging refugees Mm -hmm. um, and their refugees from wars that the U.S. has, you know, either started started (laughs) or supported in Asia and blew up, you know, just the safety and security of staying in those home countries. Right. Right, right. So um, it's really a messy thing to you know, that's very complicated to then say like, oh, you know, Asians just study hard and work hard. Um, And what's hard is there is like a new crop of immigrants. And so they may not be as familiar with the history of, you know, immigration laws or how um, Asian Americans have been kind of positioned in the political Mm -hmm. realm in the U.S. And so some folks buy into it. So that's dangerous. And, um, I don't know. It, it's this idea of like, if you buy into it, then you're grateful for the opportunity. Right. And so if anything bad happens and you, that's just the price you pay, right? Like you probably mm-hmm. will hear this from a lot of immigrants or immigrant parents of like, mm-hmm. yes, I've experienced racism, but that's little, you know, that's small compared to what, you know, we would deal with if we stayed in our home country. Right. Right. So that's yeah. like the price we pay this is not our country. So I think there's a certain level of acceptance when um, from the immigrant generation around it, um, which is hard because then it's that don't rock the boat kind of mentality, Mm -hmm. which I think is very um, disempowering, especially for younger generations, younger meaning those who are born here or Mm. or, Or grew up here, grew up here. um, Because then there's just not this acknowledgement of this is really shitty to experience racism and I shouldn't have to put up with it, but you're getting messages from maybe your own family, but maybe also from um, general U S culture of like, Oh, you don't experience racism or you shouldn't Mm -hmm. complain. And that can be really detrimental if we're talking psychological harm on the individuals, but even as a community, right. That's really hard. And I think that's the pain that has come up especially like after the Atlanta shootings and murders Mm -hmm. there, because a lot of folks, they recognize like 
this racism has been there, but mm-hmm. nobody has been believing us. Right. Right. You know, and that is actually the more painful piece for a lot of people that, that there's been this invisibility, yeah. this lack of acknowledgement, and even more than ignoring Asian Americans, a dismissal mm-hmm. of Asian Americans talking about racism and racial trauma. You know, I think that is, that's what's really painful. It's not, I mean, it, it's like piling on top of the racial trauma itself. Mm-hmm. But yeah, gaslighting folks to say, you don't even experience it or it's not as bad. You know, when they get into like oppression Olympics, it's like, it's not about that. Right? I like that oppression that, Olympics. Right. Well, right. That sense of like a hierarchy of who's more oppressed, but when you, yeah. get, when you get caught up into that, then you miss the whole thing. Well, who's at the top? Exactly. You know, when we get caught up in the oppression Olympics, you're only continuing to support white supremacy. Right. 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 That we're keeping each other down. And yeah. that's part of the work of white supremacy. Yeah. That's part that, of the system. Yeah. That you, then you working. don't notice that's what's yeah. really um, impacting everybody. And right. white supremacy harms white people too. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's, it's just a lot to unpack, you know, even mm-hmm. within this podcast, there's just so much going on there and it's continuing too. Um, and I, I was wondering, uh, do you know, or, uh, how is racial trauma or if, if there is a difference, um, how is that different from other types of trauma? Well, I think trauma is, can span a range of different experiences. Um, And I think racial trauma is really the accumulation Mm -hmm. of experiences that one has related to not just their race, but really related to racism, right? Mm -hmm. So it's Mm -hmm. racism related trauma. And, you know, you've probably heard the term microaggression. So these can be Mm -hmm. really small. Right kind of implicit moments um, where you're even questioning, was that racism? That's, yeah, you know, that's like, part oh, of the experience. Oh, you speak English so good. Oh yeah. <laughs> or how many times, right? Would, where are you from? Oh my um, gosh. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where are you really from? Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's the, acu- it can be an accumulation of small moments of these microaggressions mm-hmm. um, of being, you know, confused for a different Asian, but it can also be the more aggressive macroaggressions Mm -hmm. of racism that's, you know, being called a slur or having people Mm -hmm. stare you down, that kind of thing. So um, I don't, I mean, I think trauma is trauma in terms of whatever the source is that Mm -hmm. we are being impacted in a way where our, we feel unsafe. Mm-hmm. You know, that could be psychologically, but oftentimes that's like then connected to a physical sense of safety at a certain, uh, to a certain extent. Um, and I think it's really important to talk about intersections of oppression too, mm. um, in terms of like gendered racism, for example, or, um, you know, homophobia and transphobia. So there are a lot of different intersections uh, in terms of people's identities, but also just the mm-hmm. systems of oppression of how folks are impacted. Um, and, and so I think that can be an accumulation. So when we say racial trauma, oftentimes it's like intersecting with other uh, identities at the same time. Have you worked with clients who um, present with racial trauma? Yeah, I, it's, not necessarily the presenting concern. Okay. Um, I would say, so most of my clients are Asian or Asian American mm-hmm. and, and they seek me out because of my background and also because of my training and interest in working with Asian Americans. Mm-hmm. And, and so it becomes one of those things like they, they want me to have an understanding of their cultural background, but, you know, so they don't have to explain mm-hmm. They also don't have to justify their right, experiences. Right. And so what happens is like, it'll be one of the things that gets talked about. Okay. Um, so for example, um, working with the South Asian, like colorism, so being very dark skinned, we talked about that. Mm-hmm. And um, 
but that's not the presenting issue, but that's part of the issue because then it's related to some social anxiety, right? It, but it's mm-hmm. part of that context of like right. everything he's trying to hold in his mind. Um, yeah. And then after the Atlanta shootings, like definitely talked about gendered racism um, for a lot of my women clients yeah. who talk about like, yeah, the sexualization of Asian American women and how that's impacted them. Um, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't become a focus per se, but whew, it can really trigger things in folks because sure. they've had those experiences. And then we, we talk it through and we process it um, and we help them kind of make sense of how that fits into their current experience, their level of comfort going out in public, right? Mm-hmm. It's like a combination of COVID precaution again, but also being Asian American and all the random street attacks, right. On Asian. Oh, yeah. And so I do have several clients who say like, they are just more vigilant when they go out. Um, and then now the whole mask or don't mask situation mm-hmm. is actually making it a little bit harder because a lot of folks, they feel they still want to take precautions and wear masks, but then right. they're more, um, they feel more self-conscious because they're Asian wearing a mask. And then what are people thinking about that? So it's, it, it, I think that is a lot of stress and anxiety that folks are carrying around um, pretty consciously. Um, and, and so trying to manage that has been yeah really tough. Yeah. Yeah. And anecdotally, since you're more entrenched in uh, you know, the clinical world than I am, uh, do you see a rise in anxiety and depression in your Asian American clients um, this year, uh, last year, you know, during the pandemic and especially this year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for some folks, uh, it's definitely increased their anxiety. um, And, and for some, uh, I don't know if depression is quite the word, but grief Mm. in terms of, um, you know, just bringing into their consciousness, their own experiences of racism, you know, whereas like a lot of times it gets pushed to the, to the background, but because um, race and racism has been such a big topic this last Mm -hmm. year and so many different settings, including the workplace, I think that's kind of activating um, some feelings of grief and pain in folks. So I I think that is, so it can be old stuff. It can Mm -hmm. be a little bit more recent. It can be like in real time of like a workplace. I'm sure this is happening everywhere. Like a workplace at the surface level intention is yes, we're going to focus on DEI Mm -hmm. initiatives, but in reality, it's like super painful because they don't really understand what it means and then they keep acting out all this stuff um Mm -hmm. so i think that again it's worse it's like if you could just pretend not pretend you're trying that would be better than pretending you're trying and still being racist in your comments or sex you know so it's so there is that sense of um it's just so much more at the forefront so i think it's Mm -hmm. been really painful in a lot of ways so it can increase anxiety because you don't want to have to deal with it and a lot of times um, people of color but I think especially Asian Americans we get put in this position of trying to reassure folks that no that wasn't racist right so then Mm -hmm. again it's like this extra energy that we have to put forth so it's not just dealing with the racism I know I personally have found that I spend a lot of energy trying to help other people save face, right? When they've Interesting. done a microaggression. Um, and part of it is thinking about what's the relationship. So if it's a stranger, then I don't really care. But if it's another parent in my kid's school, I don't want them to feel embarrassed that they thought I was somebody else, the other Chinese mom in the class, you know? <laughs> but that's extra energy that we're right. always expending because I didn't take it too personally, but at the same time, it's like, then I have to go out on my way to figure out how to correct her. Cause then she needs to contact the right person. Yeah. Right? So we're spending a lot of energy also helping folks not feel shame around microaggressions. Do you think we don't have to do that? But yeah, I was going to ask you, do you, do you think it's a, uh, our kind of our burden to have to do that, to be this middle person 
You know, I, I think it becomes a burden. Um, and again, there's, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm in the middle of a continuing education training um, for BIPOC clinicians actually, which is, and one of the things we talk about, we talked about was like, yeah, do you, what do you, how do you respond to microaggressions, especially towards you? Um, and some of it is this idea of like, what is your relationship with mm. the person? Do you need to be active in correcting or is it a more passive? Thing? So there are different ways uh, of a kind of thinking it through mm -hmm. um, what's your purpose. So I, so that's kind of what helped me with this situation was thinking like, well, I, I know impact over intent, like we are trying to focus more on impact than intent mm -hmm. these days, but I, I know this person didn't mean to do this. Um, and I'm just trying to prioritize like the relationship and uh, help her out a little bit. Um, there are other situations where I don't go out of my way, like, but even that takes energy where I'm like, right. okay, now this person has emailed me after this meeting saying, I hope you didn't feel like that was, I'm sorry about that microaggression. I'm just like, okay. Um, I don't want to get into that reassurance mode. I want to acknowledge that she has sent me this email. And then I'm also not going to say it's okay. Right. Right. But I, it's a burden from the sense of like, that also is a relationship that is important to me. I, I don't know, but it's not deep enough where I want to have like a full on conversation right. and education around the topic. So it, it's hard. It, it takes it's a, a lot of balancing energy. act too. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, totally. And in a way, cause I was just thinking about, as you're talking too, I was just thinking about um, radical healing. So in a way, you know, being hurt by being mistaken as, you know, yet another Chinese person or some sort of Asian person in a way that, you know, speaking to that person, but not in an aggressive way, not calling them out, not shaming, mm -hmm. them, making sure that the relationship is intact, but at the same time calling that stuff out. Yeah. In a way, it's kind of radical healing for yourself. Yeah. So that's the other thing um, is ultimately... I think anytime you want to like name something, call it out, call it in is, are you, you know, are you doing it for yourself? I mm -hmm. think is really a helpful way to think about it. It's like, regardless of the outcome, I'm doing it more for myself to speak up. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so I think that's because we can't control the outcome. We can't control what right. other people do or say, but we can control what we do. So I think that's what's empowering is when we think about speaking up or speaking out, um, you know, what's the alternative? And, mm -hmm. and for so long, many of us kind of do the don't say anything. Right. Um, because it does take energy to speak up or speak out also. Um, but then there's something empowering too. If you've made the conscious decision to speak out because you're doing it more for yourself that you know, I need to speak my truth or I need to just call it out. Right. Meaning I'm going to just state the facts of my observation, mm -hmm. you know, which is interesting how people respond to that. It's like, this is just an observation, but people don't like it when you actually describe what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you deal with that with people like who react in a very negative, maybe aggressive way or defensive way or very defensive yeah. way yeah. yeah yeah I mean I guess being aggressive is defensive as well um you know I think a lot of it is just kind of knowing who you are and where you're coming from and when that happens just really seeing that as that person's issue mm. honestly like if, if I'm thinking about when folks have reacted to me or they're actually trying to project onto me meaning trying to make it more my issue and I'm like mm -hmm. I know that's not my issue that's your right. issue right. Um, and a lot of that comes from just self-awareness and self-knowledge of like where I stand on things I don't feel the need to explain right when we feel the need to explain that's mm -hmm. kind of a defensive yeah um, mode that we're in you know I'm at that point where I'm like I know myself pretty well and I don't need to be validated by someone who I don't have a relation, you know, right. again, it goes back to what's the nature of the relationship, but if I don't have like a strong relationship, 
relationship with this person, then I don't feel the need to prove myself to them. So if they're kind of reacting in all different kinds of ways, I'm just like, wow, that's your issue. And you, you got to work that out yourself. Great. Well, um, so I think that is it. Um, any last, uh, last minute, uh, you know, takeaways that you would like to say? Last thoughts? Well, I think if we go back to the radical healing and radical self-care piece, um, I just want to say it's really important to, again, know yourself, be, and and part of that is slowing down to be in tune with yourself. Oh, what does that mean? (laughs) I know. (laughs) slowing down well because we're in a culture where it's go 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 um, right uh, and do more and be productive Mm -hmm. Um, and I myself have operated that way like I'm very much like got to be on time Mm -hmm. try to be organized be on top of everything Um, but I'm realizing sometimes the urge to clean out my inbox has me agreeing to things I don't, I don't want to do. So if I slow down, I'm going to reflect a little bit more on how I'm going to respond to an email, for example, like get in touch. Do I really want to do this? No, Mm -hmm. I don't. So then I can take the time to figure out how to respond in a way that, you know, fits really what I truly want to do. So I think there's that piece of slowing down so we can pay attention to Mm -hmm what we really want to do. And um, I think we have stopped trusting our intuition as much as, you know, we really need to pay a little bit more attention to that. Yeah. Um, That gut feeling, I think it goes a long way because it's, it's that subconscious, like processing everything that we've been experiencing. And Mm -hmm. it's telling us, no, I don't have the energy for that. Or that's just doesn't quite fit for me so that's part of the slowing down Mm -hmm. I think will help us figure out what we need sometimes it's I need more space to heal Mm -hmm. I need to talk to other people or maybe I do want to do you know do something more active but I can't imagine what those things are what are those possibilities if I'm constantly trying to do the grind culture of what's expected of me and what I expect of myself but if we slow down and we can imagine other possibilities. It's really interesting what comes out of that um, in terms of being an activist even, Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it's for our personal like fulfillment, like what do I want to do for my career? Um, But sometimes it's also like, how do I want to be in the world if if indeed social justice is one of your values or Mm -hmm. um, purposes, then when you slow down, you can actually figure out different ideas a little bit more easily. And that's something I'm actively working on. Um, It's, it's, so as much as I'm talking about it, I'm barely keeping up with what I'm saying (laughs) to, (laughs) to, to practice it myself. But, you know, I was saying the other day to someone, it's like, I was writing just to write. And they were like, mm. say what? Like, it's not for <laughs> a blog. It's not for an article, a manuscript. And I was like, right. And when we write or when we have time to reflect, we can, mm. a lot of interesting ideas come together. So even though I know I right. run this stuff through my head, I'm processing it more as I write. And there's definitely mm-hmm. research about, you know, when you write, um, especially about emotions and ideas mm-hmm. that you process it more. Um, but then ideas come from that as well, in terms of how I want to be in this world, what, for me personally, I'm thinking like, what's my contribution? How do I work towards racial justice? If I don't slow down, you know, if I kept at my old job, and I just kept doing the same, yeah. old, same, old, I had no space to imagine what I could be doing differently. Yeah. Right. So that's my wish is for folks to slow down even for a little bit, you know, 10 minutes a day and and really allow yourself to kind of sit with feelings or sit with ideas, sketch out random thoughts that you've been holding in your head. Actually, a lot of thoughts for blogs have come from hike when I'm hiking. <laughs> oh, nice. And then I, and then I make sure I kind of write it down in my notes and, mm-hmm. um, but but, you know, it's like, we have to give ourselves those times. And then when we come up with ideas, then we're also refreshing ourselves because that's what excites us to keep mm-hmm. going and to do things. And then we come up with more ideas along the way. And that's part of liberation, right? That you can mm. 
have choice in what you do and how you are in the world. And it certainly helps when you are in community with other folks. Yes. And so that's really important too, is to make sure you're in community, that you're supporting one another to do this work. Um, that's why I'm meeting with those high schoolers because they are working really hard. They're trying to put out all this information, but their parents don't quite know how to support them. And so I want to support them to understand they're already doing it by being in community mm-hmm. in their organization. That's great for them. Right? Start young. Yeah. They are amazing. Like they are going to save yeah. us. Right? The people <laughs> save us. But right. it's this idea of it's really a mindset, Anna. It's really about understanding how important it is yeah. to be in community with folks and to be in connection because that's what will keep us going. Yeah, that's definitely you know um, a collectivistic mm-hmm. type of uh, mindset and this whole notion of time that you have to be done at a certain time or be somewhere at a certain time. It's colonized mentality Mm -hmm. also Mm -hmm. you know Mm because when you think about it our ancestors uh you know you get there when you get there (laughs) (laughs) that I mean that's really hard you know to unlearn I mean I don't know that I'm ever going to completely unlearn that piece right because I got like other personal stories behind that (laughs) um workout issues but but yeah, it's so when people are talking about the decolonize your mind, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not getting caught up in that terminology. I'm definitely on that path of like, there's a lot I have to unlearn mm-hmm. Yeah, in order to feel like I can be more fully myself. In right. The world. Um, and, and so, yeah, it is really this kind of full circle of acknowledging, like most of us come from collective yeah collectivist cultures and that there's a reason for that you know connection is so important and so much of like the clinical issues that we see you know in therapy in the therapy room it's related to not feeling really connected yeah like genuinely connected to people yeah there's definitely the disconnect well Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Wise words from Dr. Chen. I I really appreciate your time and your wisdom and sharing, uh, you know, your experiences with us. Um, So thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. Of course.